Welcome to Loop TV. I'm your host, Gene Munster, along with Loop's Doug Clinton. Our topic today is Apple in health. Use that uh, word very specifically. That is their overall initiative around health and wellness and the path forward. And as a starting point is Apple has said that their greatest contribution is going to be around health and wellness. And of course, saving one person's life uh, would make that the greatest contribution. And undoubtedly, uh, Apple Watch has saved many people's lives. And so you could just check that box there, but we think there is something more there. I want to give some more context to the topic of health is that from a high level, we think there are three big buckets that Apple can still grow into that can make a $350 billion company continue to become much bigger. Uh, that in order rank file here is augmented reality. Second is something around auto and third is around health. And so as Doug and I were talking more about the health topic, uh, we wanted to dig a little deeper into what could be their path forward. Uh, as a reminder, the Wall Street Journal published in the end of June about the company's struggles within their Casper division, which is the code name, and specifically that they are trying to find their way forward and they are working with uh, even uh, testing some primary care clinics that they're running for their own employees. And so that's the, the setup here is it's a juicy opportunity for Apple uh, health and what is the substance behind how this is going to play out. Uh, I'm going to turn to you, Doug, here. When you, as you contemplate all of the forces at play here and the opportunity around uh, Apple and health, what do you think about? I think about two things, just knowing Apple, kind of starting there, just what is their sort of DNA as a company and what have they done in the past to give us an indication of what they might do in the future I think piece number one is just given how they've made this really big uh, sort of effort around data and privacy, and uh, particularly with, with IDFA in the new iOS version, uh, giving people more control over how they get advertised to with their data. I think they're gonna be very sensitive with how they might share medical data uh, with partners. And so I don't think we'll see Apple try to monetize or make a business out of health by selling people's health data. It just doesn't really go with their ethos. Let me interrupt um, there and put a finer point on the privacy piece. At this year's WWDC, they dedicated about 10 minutes to health. And three times they mentioned uh, the sanctity of privacy. And even when sharing with your doctor, Apple doesn't see that data. That of course is in line with what the company has said all along about the importance of privacy. And I just want to uh, put uh, an underline on your point is Apple cares about privacy and it adds a layer of complexity to the health opportunity. Absolutely. And it's, it's really become a big part of their brand too. And so, yeah, I think if, if they went down that route, it would be a difficult thing for them to sort of rationalize with where what, they've gone. Yeah. What would be down that route? What are you referring to? If, if somehow they would say, okay, we're going to start uh, selling, even with customer permission, I think it'd be hard, but selling your medical records to uh, medical providers for, you know, a sort of a direct transaction, I think that would be difficult for them to build a business around that direct so that, data monetization. That makes sense is that when you uh, presumably healthcare providers would want to see some of this data, you can debate how solid the data is, which we'll get to in a second here. But Yes, if they would charge health providers access to that, that could get them into a firestorm from a PR standpoint. And I think there's, I mean, there's a workaround to that, which maybe the app store is sort of a blueprint to that. And I know there's been data, they sort of now every year they put out this data about the economic value created on the app store. And I think last year was something around 600 billion and change in terms of total economic value created. And so that includes things like Uber rides and, and DoorDash orders and things like that, but it also includes the software uh, transactions that are done on the App Store. And in that case, right, they're not directly monetizing data. Customers are allowing these apps to use their data, and then those customers are choosing whether or not they want to patronize those apps. And so I think that's you know a more likely scenario in terms of how can Apple take all this great information that they have from the devices, the hardware and software integrated that 
that they sort of empower uh, their ecosystem through and then give it to providers, whether they're medical providers, whether they're technology companies and let them build health products around that data. Makes sense. And so they could have a, the app store. Well, let, let's keep kind of marching down the, the, the road to there's the data piece in between. They need to be very careful about how they get there. Do you think that they uh, would, as they've, they've been testing now, uh, doing, being a primary care network, and presumably the opportunity is to make your health and wellness uh, really simple, and you find a doctor and schedule the doctor through your iOS app, and uh, what's the viability of them uh, ultimately finding that that is the path forward? I think it would be tough. I mean, there's, there's a couple things out of balance there. One is just to understand the world and sort of the, the healthcare ecosystem. The best thing that any company could do would be to set up a clinic and sort of live through what does it mean to run a business like this? So I think you could say, and just look at it as maybe this is purely experimental and Apple's just trying to understand the world a little bit better by living in it and doing it. You know, that would make logical sense. Um, the second thing that maybe makes it a little bit more uh, tough to write it off as just an experience, uh, experiment is Apple has always been uh, built around the idea of integrated hardware and software. They've always wanted to kind of control the entire ecosystem as they develop and put products out into the world. And so that would sort of logically necessitate that they do maybe have a, a tighter control on, on those experiences. Um, I don't know that they want to get into that business. It does seem like a pretty vast departure from the world they live in now. You know, a genius bar is different than running, you know, a, a quick care clinic for sure, even though they understand how to build retail and do it really well. Um, so to me, I think it's probably more experimental, but I, think you, I don't think you can write off the reality that they do like these integrated ecosystems. Uh, but I'd be curious how you think about it. I think it's a stretch that they get there. I think that their talk about their violin concerto being hardware, software, and services. You could see why primary care is a service, but it just feels a half a step, two steps outside of, of what they really know, which kind of brings us back to the top piece, the data capture piece, and just to highlight a little bit around data capture. So primarily the data comes from Apple Watch today. They sell approximately 40 or so million of those units. About 10% of iPhone owners have Apple Watch. Eventually, that probably gets to 40% plus. And the, uh, the data capture, obviously, there's uh, your heart rate. Uh, they have this AFib piece, uh, your sleep tracking, your steps. Uh, these are the oxygen sensor on blood oxygen sensor more recently. Uh, it is worth noting that the data that's captured uh, is the vast majority of it, all except the AFib data is, uh, is, is a, a level, a class one uh, designation, which basically is for entertainment purposes. And so there is a, as we've talked to uh, pros in the, the healthcare space, um, they use that term again, that, that a lot of the data is for entertainment purposes, which for us is kind of a leading indicator, like how serious does Apple want to be about health and wellness uh, for that really to take off. Uh, we believe it needs to start with getting more of the features on Apple Watch to be a class two uh, approved. And what that essentially does is it opens up uh, the, the amount of uh, health professionals that will uh, respect the data within that. And so when we think about Apple's overall initiatives, uh, I think that that's one thing to, to keep an eye on. They've, they've added some nice features more recently, or at least, at least with the update that's coming out this summer, there's three big updates. One is around, they call it mobility, which basically uh, keeps track of your, your walking gait and making sure you're steady. Uh, second is there's better insights around labs and um, the third is around trends and picking up on some biomarkers and letting you know when things are starting to be off base, you can get messages. If, for example, your heart rate's starting to move at elevated levels, your blood oxygen's dropping, there are things that they can kind of flag for you. And last is an option to share your data directly with a doctor, a primary doctor. And so they're working with uh, the healthcare digital records players like Cerna and um, uh, I think Express Scripts to uh, to start to offer that. 
so this, uh, I just want to kind of anchor it as, uh, as we think about this, the, the tip of the spear for Apple and health awareness, it starts with data that's respected. And I was surprised uh, recently to try to join a study uh, through research kit. And I found that there were four studies that were uh, open for me to join. Maybe there was something about me that uh, made me less appealing. It felt like that's what they had on there is four studies. And uh, I think that that speaks to the amount of studies that, that ultimately respect the data coming from these. And so I'm a big believer in the power and what they're doing and advancing this. I do see an opportunity around making the data more credible. And I think that that will be a tell uh, for their success in healthcare. And I'm gonna go back to you on that, Doug. Is, is, is that, do you think, uh, reading the tea leaves to look at how many devices and what, uh, or what, how many features have what uh, classification? Do you think that's a good way to kind of get a sense of how serious they are? I think it probably is. And, and I think that we shouldn't lose the, the real headline and, and what Apple's advantage is in all of this, which is I don't think there's any other company in the world that can create essentially a medical device to your point, going from eventually you know class one now to class two and, and integrating deeper features and better data sets. But no one else can create a mass market medical device that people actually want to wear uh, in mass, true mass. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that. we have the toothbrush test, which yeah. for something to work, it's got to be uh, used as frequently as a toothbrush. And I think the watch has hit that milestone. I think so. And it's it's made it easy. You don't even have to think about it. And that's that's the important part is it sort of sits there on your wrist, passively collects all this data. And that is a really valuable space for Apple to be in. So sort of in my mind, no matter how they end up figuring out what is the right mechanism to monetize this data, I think the real moat is they are probably the only ones that can collect the amount of data they're collecting and have customers that really want to use these devices to collect that data um, from a hardware uh, standpoint. So that really, to me, is their moat. And you know, the data, we'll see how they monetize it. I'm sure they'll figure out a creative way to do it. Let me ask you this. Do they get there? Can they... Uh, break open this opportunity, whether it's through an app store with a device that is only one feature right now is as a, a level two certification. Do they need to get more? Do you agree with me on that? Do you disagree? Is that, I think, going to be a leading, do you believe that that's going to be a leading indicator? Um, I think there are, I think there's probably a lot of creative things that people can do that people are just experimenting with right now. Even some of uh, the companies that we've invested in in the past um, I don't know how much I can say about some of their projects. So I won't kind of front run them, but I know that they are using watch data that, you know, doesn't require anything more than the current watch. Uh, and they're using it to augment uh, patient outcomes uh, for some pretty severe maladies. So, you know, I think adding new features and getting better data, more reliable data, uh, I think is is certainly something that will broaden the ecosystem and make the types of applications that these providers can create richer. But I think there's a lot of creative stuff people can do already by taking the data and you know, using other data sets they have, kind of combining them uh, and doing some, some uh, sort of fusion in that sense to still do some really compelling things. So I, I think the watch is already really powerful without any of the future development. Well, you know, one of the, the powers having the watch on your hand and whether it's entertainment purposes or for health and actually improving your, your wellness is uh, the question about do people actually, do they want to make hard changes? And we've recently spoke to a person in the industry who is uh, well aware of uh, behaviors around health and wellness. And this person said that, uh, that for people really to change, uh, they need to have uh, some event, a, uh, a sickness, or uh, a friend becomes sick, and they uh, all of a sudden, uh, if you will, get religion about uh, uh, health and wellness and start to take it seriously. But uh, this person's view is the vast majority of, of people really don't want to change. They'll do everything in their power uh, to keep things as is. And there's a power user group of 10% that loves all the metrics uh, that, that get uh, spewed from the Apple Watch. And so my, my question is, uh, you know, is this something where it just sounds good? 
uh, but ultimately people aren't going to change and they're, they'll get the watch, but really not change their behavior. No, I think, well, if I think about med tech broadly and the watch is maybe the centerpiece of it, the purpose to me is to take those hard changes and make them a little bit easier and keep making them a little bit easier and to reduce or kind of lower that hurdle. So instead of, you know, seeing someone die from cancer or whatever the thing is that used to be the hurdle where someone would start to take their health seriously, you know, maybe now it's something much simpler, you know, they get winded just walking up the stairs or they just don't feel right. And if the hurdle's low enough and they can say, oh, you know, Apple has this app and it's collecting all this data from my wrist and it can help me do this thing X that used to be really hard and now it's not that hard. I think that's sort of the point. That's sort of the ultimate win for health tech in general is to make the hard stuff a lot easier and hopefully lower that hurdle so that more people take their health more seriously uh, at, a, at a quicker rate. Makes sense. And just to recap, I think we agree it's a stretch that they become a primary caregiver uh, and we also believe that they're going to do more here hard to exactly define what that roadmap looks like it starts with a watch and they continue to add features around that you know when we think about this expanding apple's market cap they do need to do something uh, in one of these three categories augmented uh, uh, automotive or uh, health and wellness and so uh, thank you, Doug. I always appreciate, uh, for those uh, viewers who don't know, uh, Doug is uh, very much in the performance uh, health and the uh, concept, he has a wonderful concept. You should write about this on your Substack, Doug, but this, the concept of uh, not just living longer, but uh, really optimizing your health. I'm not going to steal, but there's no spoiler alerts here. I'm just going to end it at that, Doug, but please write <laughs> I'll, about I'll, well, that. Well, let me, I'll, I'll steal the spotlight just before you end it, because it I was actually having kind of a fun conversation on Twitter last night about this, where there's people usually think about uh, longevity and sort of healthcare in two spectrums, which is length of life. So, so true longevity and then quality. And uh, the debate I was sort of having with somebody was there's actually a third component, which is meaning that's sort of, I think, uh, underappreciated because even if you can live longer, and even if you can live longer with uh, you know, a better quality of life, better mental faculty, better physical faculty, uh, this person was sort of arguing, if you don't really have a purpose, uh, it's just living longer, like what's the point? And I actually thought that was a really sort of profound insight uh, from this guy named Zohar, uh, who's a great philosopher. And so I think we should start thinking about you know, health tech and future of healthcare and, and not forget about the reality that if we are gonna live longer and uh, have better health for a long period of time, we also need to take care of this reality of just sort of having a purpose and like having a meaning to life because that can degrade, I think the quality of your life uh, and the length of your life if you don't have something to sort of work toward. Wow, I need a minute there. I can say, feel lucky uh, to have meaning. Uh, lucky to say uh, this, that People come uh, for Gene because I've been around for a long time. They stay for Doug. Uh, as always, you deliver on behalf of Doug, on behalf of Apple, and whatever their ambitions are in health. And Gene Munster and Loop TV, bye for now.